everybody. I'm Marianne Borkert with Aging at Home Fairbanks. And um, we've been doing these downsizing meetings for, gosh, over a year. I don't know, monthly. And uh, today we're going to talk about books, but usually we start with asking what have you been able to do over the last month or so with downsizing? Any success stories? I have a success story. Good. <laughs> I, my crawl space is cleaned out, except wow. for just a few few things. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's it was a lot of cardboard, a lot of styrofoam <laughs> from old computer boxes. <clears throat> just junk. The styrofoam stuff, does anybody use that or do we no. just have to throw it in the dumpsters? It has to go to the dump, I think. Okay. It did go to the dump, I should say. <laughs> Great. But now I've got a truckload of, of folded cardboard ready to recycle. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. So I get the gold star. You get the gold <laughs> star for sure. I can't say that I've gotten a whole lot done this month. Next month, uh, we will be talking with Jerry Cleveworth about, Judy, are you here? Yes, I um, am. Do you want to say something about your conversations with Jerry Cleveworth? Yes. He's going to talk about his um, coin shop down on 2nd Avenue. And as you, if you've been in there recently, um, they not only do coins, but they do uh, a last can of books and they also have ivory and that sort of thing. And so he'll be talking about all those subjects. Uh, we're still working out the date uh, when it's convenient for him. Uh, so. And that one might be at five o'clock rather than at three. Um, yes. because he has to close the shop before he gets, can get on online. So um, we may, the time may change, but, but that should be really interesting um, to, uh, to talk to him too. So uh, I think some of us, as you can see, have lots of books <laughs> behind us on the shelves, but um I'd like to introduce Greg Hill, who is a former director of the library and a columnist with uh, the News Miner. Love reading the columns that you write because you're interested in so many things, Greg. But uh, maybe give you a chance to introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about your experiences dealing with books with the library and since then. Um, and I was going to say something else, but I've forgotten what. So <laughs> welcome, Greg. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, I should probably start by saying that my wife, Claire, thought it was hilarious that I was being asked to speak on this subject uh, because downsizing uh, libraries isn't my specialty. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, my next column, uh, uh, hopefully, if it turns out the way I think, uh, we'll get in it'll, uh more accurately describes my personal library as an anti-library. And an anti-library is uh, consists of a lot of books that you haven't read yet and why that's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but the bigger disclaimer is that, uh, that I'm no expert on evaluating books. <clears throat> it's one of those things that I've, I've realized pretty early on that, uh, that, uh, the more I know about evaluating books and deciding what's worthwhile and valuable and needed and ready to toss, uh, the less I know, actually. <clears throat> but one thing I learned is that if you think you've got a valuable book, you want to get somebody that's really well trained to tell you what it's worth. And that costs money. They're expensive. Or, um, the, the, a book appraiser who is... Uh, going to be accredited with the IRS uh, is uh, uh, is an expensive proposition oftentimes. <clears throat> but that being said, I have been around a lot of books 
And I've had some experiences with valuable books and near misses with valuable books. Uh, one, you know, the uh, the library. Well, we'll get we'll get into that. The uh, there's uh, there's basically three options for downsizing your personal collection of books, uh, and that's the uh, libraries or used book outlets like Forget Me Not Books, uh, rare book dealers <clears throat> like uh, Larry, uh, Jerry Cleworth has some rare books, but he's not what I would call a rare book dealer. Um, a rare book dealer is somebody that's extremely knowledgeable and has a collection of them, and they know they they know the market and all that very well. My favorite one is Arundel Books in Seattle. That's usually who I go to first for rare books. It's A R U N D E L Books downtown. It's it's a hoot to go to. Um, the other place that, of course, you can your other option is the landfill. And uh, basically, for most situations, uh, including for libraries, used book outlets, and rare book dealers, they all utilize the landfill quite a bit. Uh, the library has to because there's some books that are so terribly damaged, are they're stinky, are they're extremely dated. One of the things we look at in libraries when we're weeding our collection is we look to see in public libraries, I should say, they differ, like school, academic, university, special libraries, public libraries. They all have slightly, they're all the same in some regards. They all collect books and organize them and disseminate them to the people that are supposed to use them. But they're all different in important ways. And one of the ways is with public libraries, if a book hasn't been checked out in five, 10 years, then it's a candidate to be weeded out of the collection and either sold or donated or tossed to the landfill. With university libraries, for example, they're much more uh, history oriented, academically oriented. They're, they're going to hold on to all the various uh, editions in, uh, of a particular book because students might be using it in that regard. But, um, the, uh, but when it comes to libraries, as far as what you're gonna do with your books, the Fairbanks North Star Borough libraries are out of the question. They're not taking uh, donations. That's uh, because they're going to be closed for 10 months for uh, ex for their expansion project, <laughs> which, frankly, as an aside, I find abhorrent and completely startling. We did an equally big project in the late 90s for with Noel Ween. We carpeted the whole thing, new HVAC. We expanded four walls, uh, and we were closed for two weeks total. So 10 months. It's just staggering to me that, that they're going to do that. But anyway, if they don't have the space to store the books, so they're not taking any. Uh, there's some other options. Some worth considering might be some of the smaller nearby libraries like Ninana and uh, Delta Junction. That Those might be some options for a place that, that, that would be taking some just regular positive, you know, fun to read books. Rasmussen Library will take some, but they have to be very picky. They're looking for things that are going to appeal to uh, their students and faculty for research and more academically oriented. So they're not going to want a lot of uh, paperback romances or science fiction or, or popular fiction as a rule. They're just going to concentrate on more academic subjects. But uh, I've posted a number of things in the chat, uh, including the person to contact at Rasmussen Library on uh, a possibility of where you could, uh, uh, or you could at least contact them and tell them what you've got and, and they could. Uh, uh, give you an idea if they could accept it or not. There's also uh, special libraries that might be open to it. Like there's libraries at Ileson and at Wainwright. Uh, they might need some popular reading materials. I don't know currently, but they might be worth checking, contacting the library person there to see if that's a place that, uh, that they might be uh, open to taking some books. Uh, there's also, uh, but you know, any of these groups are going to be uh, wary of getting your garbage, you know, getting your problem that they're going to have to deal with. And so they're going to, uh, but still they might be open to it, but you just know that going into it, that's going to be the situation. Another option that some people don't think about that's worthwhile is uh, little libraries, little free libraries. I don't know if you've heard about this program, but people make a little small space you know, the size of a couple of bread boxes, a big couple of mailboxes uh, in an area that are enclosed with a door. 
And they put books that people can come and take and replace it free or put other ones in, that sort of thing. I've put the website, uh, there's a website for Little Free Libraries. There's a map and you can see where they are here in Fairbanks. I think there's six or eight in Fairbanks. There's a couple in North Pole. And if nothing else, just drive by and stuff some of your books in there. Uh, one of the places I take books uh, regularly is uh, the Esther Post Office. In the lobby, they have a small area that people can drop off books. And uh, a lot of the books that get dropped off there end up in the John Trigg Library, which is the Esther Library. It's not a pub, it's open to the public. They have limited hours, but that might be another possibility for donating locally, particularly uh, the uh, you know popular reading materials. The um, I'll, I'll hold off on speaking about uh, like a forget me not books. I don't know their situation varies on the flow of books that come in there. Uh, but uh, hopefully the bookstore person will be here and can talk more about their situation. If not, I'll um, ad lib on that a little later. But a lot of people want to know is what about my books that are might be valuable, that that have a uh, that might be worth just looking into a little bit more. Uh, the first place I direct people to that I go to to try to determine uh, just to get a rough idea of a book's value is bookfinder.com. And uh, oh, did I get that up there? Yep, there's bookfinder.com is their addresses in chat too. Uh, and it's a, uh, that's, oh, I forget, like 150 million books, 10,000 book dealers. Uh, you know, uh, Powell's Books is listed there. A lot of the big book, huge, huge bookstores are listed there. And uh, they start with the least expensive and they go to the most expensive. So you can get an idea, but so much of it depends on condition. And in, spe in fact, uh, there's three basic elements to determine the value of a book. Uh, one is how rare is it and what condition is it in and how much demand is there for it. Um, and it was interesting. I've, I've done a, I've helped out a few folks around town. Uh, like when Henry Cole passed away, uh, I helped go through his library because they were they thought that he had mentioned that there were several books that had some value there. And we found, you know, gosh, a half dozen that, you know, worth anywhere from maybe 50 to a couple of hundred dollars. Um, you just you just never know. But uh, I always think back on uh, the, the importance of, of getting if you think you've got something or even if you don't think you've got anything and but but it might be worth bouncing it off somebody with a little more expertise. Like I said, there's book appraisers that are very expensive to consult, but there's also used book dealers around the country that are easy to locate. And you can send your books to them and they'll, you know, if you pay the postage both ways, they sometimes will uh, review your books for you and tell you if they're worth something or not. Once, when I was down in Texas, uh, my wife and I were going to go to Austin uh, and a teacher friend of her, a woman that she taught with, had an, inherited some old books from the 1700s. And uh, she wondered if I knew if there's any value to them. And so I looked at them and I, I mean, they're just old books. The authors weren't notable. The subjects weren't notable. They were, in, you know, decent uh, condition for books that age. Uh, but uh, they were all, they were, I think, well, a couple from the, like 1810, several from 1790, around that, that, that era. And, uh, but since we're going to Austin, she asked if we would pass them along to a, a rare book dealer that she uh, had contacted there. And, and so we did, we took them down and it turns out these books that I didn't notice anything was odd about or had any uh, extenuating circumstances. It turns out the end papers, you know, that's, uh, the end papers are the parts in the, the very beginning of the book. This is a pretty good book too. I will judge you by your bookshelf. <laughs> uh, the, that uh, It turns out that in one of those books from the 1790s, the end papers were all continental currency, continental Congress currency. And I didn't notice it paging through it, but you know that's the sort of thing you just don't know about. It increases the, the provenance of the books. Uh, now, under rarity, the things they're going to be looking at, of course, that's age. How old is it? How scarce is it? Uh, you know, those are the things they're going to be looking at there. Uh, and that's something to realize that uh, a book that's 100 years old is not necessarily considered old. Uh, 
a car that's 20 years old is considered a classic. Books aren't considered old unless they're pre-1830 as a rule of thumb. Then you've got an old book. But 100 years old, those are still, you know, 1920s. Jeez, that's not that long ago anymore. Under con the scarcity, you know, that's it depends on the demand. Who wants it and how hard is it to find? Uh, some books, it's like the original uh, Moby Dick by Melville was a bust. You know, it was published in England first and then it was published and they misprinted. The typist missed up, messed up on some paragraphs, left lines out. And so the London critics trashed the book. The American critics didn't even read it before it got here. And it was published here after that. And they trashed it just because of what the London reviewers had said. And, and poor Melville went to his grave thinking he had been a bust on that on his whale book. But then it became really popular. It was revived uh, thanks to Rockwell Kent. Of course, the Nolwenn Library has a notable collection of Rockwell Kent art. And there's a, uh, uh, and we have a first edition of, of uh, Moby Dick there, but we don't have the first edition. Uh, first editions are, uh, well, let's see, there's, well, we'll get into first editions just a little bit because there it's it's quite complicated uh, to get into that. But basically, the uh, in the nineteen teens, nineteen twenties, uh, the publisher wanted uh, contacted. I think it's Viking contacted uh, Rockwell Kent and asked him to illustrate a book of uh, two years before the mast, uh, a nonfiction book uh, by Maserat about. Uh, sailing as a sailor around the Horn and up to California in the 1840s. And it's an interesting book, but uh, Rockwell Kent said he would, uh, that he didn't want to do it, but he would do this book that nobody knew about called Moby Dick. And they did a good edition of it. He illustrated it. And that is the famous edition. But of course, it's if you had one of those first mangled editions, that's worth more than the Rockwell Kent edition that came out in the 1920s. We do have a first edition of that in the rare books at Nolwenn Library too, with with his gorgeous uh, illustrations. Uh, the uh, under condition, this is really you know conditions uh, vary so much. So much of it's subjective, but basically you're going. There's a scale of conditions from mint condition to fine condition to, you know, gets down to good, to acceptable, you know, it, it goes all the way down and it, there's a huge drop off. If a book has a library stamp in it, for example, it could be a, a like a first edition of uh, oh, The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway, but if it's got a library stamp edition, uh, mark in it, that means its value is 90% less than if it didn't. That's just what the way the, the prices go in on condition. The, um, The, the when you get into demand, that's where you start getting into valuations, you know. Uh, and the one of the things to realize is that if you do have a book that appears to have some value, and you've talked to a rare book dealer and they said, Yeah, this book does have some value. In fact, you know, you look on Book Fighter and it says it's worth $400. Well, you're not going to be able to sell it to a book dealer for $400. You might be able to luck on to putting it on eBay or something and finding a collector who would pay that much, even though it's worth that to a collector, it's not worth that much to a book dealer who has to cover all their overhead costs and who have to determine how long they're going to be stuck with this book over the long haul. Um, they need to make a profit and uh, just like everybody else. But one of the most important things about valuing a book to me is how much is it worth to you? Uh, I, I always harken back to the advice by Winston Churchill, where he said you should constantly go through your library, just walk around it, look at the titles on the shelf, and decide which of those you want to be friends with still. Some of them are just nodding acquaintances. Some of them are old dear friends you're going to refer to again. And you have to make that choice book by book. And if it's not worth being a good friend of yours, then get rid of it and get it to somebody else. But that's the problem. I've got way too many friends here. And somebody that doesn't help is Forget Me Not Books. And I see that now Forget Me Not Books is on the air with us. So I'll turn it over to her. 
Denise, are you with us? I'm here. Great. Good to see you. You too. <laughs> well, we got started with Greg and a uh, great introduction on um, overview and some of the work that he's done. But um, I would like to introduce you to maybe talk a little bit about Forget Me Got Not Books and and um, how things work when books are donated. And I'm sure we'll have time, lots of questions once we get done with whatever we all you all want to say. But um, Denise is the bookstore manager at Forget Me Not Books. And she told me on the phone last week that she goes through every box of books that we donate. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that is a huge job, I know, because I've taken some boxes of books over there and they're just stacked to the ceiling. So I admire you for that. Anyway, welcome. We're glad to have you here. And if you could let us know um, a little more about you and uh, how things work at Forget Me Not Books. Okay. Um, well, uh, first off, you know, everything that we have here is donated by people in the community. And that's, when I say community, I mean, that's from Delta and Toke all the way around through Numana out to uh, uh, Denali Park. We have people that all the way ray in round and in between that bring stuff to us here. And so, like you said, I go through all the donations and we decide what we're going to put into the store and what we're going to put into our donations um, to we, we, what we call our recycle program. We uh, donate books to any nonprofit event or organization around the state who asks for them. And so we have books going out to villages, down to Anchorage, um, just all over town. And we donate, uh, I don't know, several thousand books to those, probably around 20 or more thousand books to these other nonprofits. Um, all the books that we decide to keep for the store then get, uh, we go through and wipe them down, clean them up and check for more, you know, check for damage. And then uh, we also scan a lot of the stuff to see what they're going for online and to see whether they're going to go into the store or if they're going to go to our online sales person who then lists them at abe or amazon.com. And those are all going to be books that are more than a certain base price because, you know, we have to, with shipping and everything else, we have to be able to make a profit. So on them. And then everything else goes into the store and is whether it's kids or whatever. And those books, obviously there's the proceeds from those sales support the Literacy Council education programs. So people getting their GED, learning English, becoming citizens, um, just pe youngsters, uh, 16 to 24, trying to get on an education and career path and our after school program over at Birch Park. So. We keep very, very busy over here. <laughs> Where are uh, some of the good places to um, look online for? Um, well, we, um, we have a few that we check regularly. Um, there's, of course, mm -hmm. Abe and Amazon to see what other sellers are selling them there for. Um, we also check a site called isbns.net. And they're, you know, just to check there, see what other they can find for what other people are selling it for online at a number of different sites. And we also use a, a site called bookfinder.com. And they just let they it does a search and it checks all kinds of other bookseller websites online and comes back with what they're selling them for. And then we make the decision whether we're going to put it in the store or if it's going to go to Jackie to sell online. So, yeah, Greg mentioned Bookbinder. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I like about Bookbinder in particular is you can do an advanced search. You can put in all sorts of information to make sure you get the exact edition you want because there's a jillion editions of a lot of books that are out there. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we use the, um, there's the Independent American Booksellers Association. Um, we use their guidelines for the description of our books is what like Greg was talking about, whether it's, you know, like new, fine, acceptable, good, you know, all the different ratings as far as for how we um, list our books as far as the condition. And on 
bookseller dot or I mean bookfinder.com. You can even put in whether it's a hardback or softback. You can put in if it's a signed or a first edition, you know, has all these buttons for filling in all these things, like he said, to find the exact edition that you're trying to sell. Yeah, that's one of the things with book value, too, is the provenance. If it's got signature, if it's signed by the author or if it's got an interesting message inside or if it's somebody important who's received it that the author signed them to, um, those type of things are or if it's something that somebody was carrying in a particular battle and you can prove it. Those type of things all add add value to books, too. Provenance. <laughs> Denise, you said something about sending books out to other places, nonprofits, and I assume schools and things yes. in the state. Mm -hmm. um, do the villages, uh, the schools and community centers um, want books? I mean, if we were to thinking that people in the villages might be interested in some of our books, would it be good for us to contact you about sending them out or yeah well the thing is is obviously we can't afford to pay for them books to be shipped out to the villages and stuff because somebody has to carry you know pay the carrier who hauls them um so we send them to we have there's a few places that somebody has already is paying for them to go out to those sites and they just pick the books up and get them to the the airline or whoever is bringing them out to those remote locations or sending them down to Anchorage, et cetera. Otherwise, if it's in town, there's a few places that our recycle folks deliver to and everybody else just comes here and picks up their books. So we box them up and and if they want them once a month, once every other month, or if it's a one time or, you know, they just let us know that. But it's a you know we, you know we have it out there that we do this service and then just people have to you know they come to us if they need the books. We don't. Do they have, ask we don't have specific. To, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, we, it's just we don't. We only have two ladies that do all the you know all the bo boxing up the books and satisfying all the requests. And yeah, they don't have the resources to reach out to all the communities to find out if they need books. It's, it's, we just, if you come to us, we'll give them to you. <laughs> Do they ask for specific titles or just a genre or, you know? Um, usually just genres, because it's really hard to do specific titles since mm -hmm. everything is donated. We don't know what we're going to have in advance, but sometimes they'll do like specific authors and if whatever we have available by, by that author, we'll give them. Mm -hmm. And then they, we have, you know, they can say age ranges, you know, for whether it's, they want children's picture books, children's chapter books, young adult books, adult books, you know, fiction, nonfiction. As long as it's a nonprofit event or organization, because, you know, we're not going to give you books for to turn around and sell and make a profit on. <laughs> what about uh, Alaska? Anna? Do you have... Oh special oh sorry go ahead oh well do you have uh, special ways of dealing with books from alaska or about alaska? Um, we uh the, the alaska books um what we have is we've made up a, a big spreadsheet which is constantly being updated where we put down we've researched the books alaska books and what they're going for online and then we set our price for it and so then all the copies of that book will you know we just price it that way except for ones that are above a certain price and then we just have that it's an online book and then Jackie you know will list that and she'll usually if it's a book she hasn't seen for a little bit she will uh, research it again and mm -hmm. find out what it's going for now as to what the price that she's going to sell it for online. I just posted also the contact information from UAF from yeah. their Alaskana uh, or the, their Alaska collection and also their archives, because uh, you might have some real interesting photographs or manuscripts or, you know, dissertations, those type of things that might be of strong interest to them. Hmm. Uh, I've been uh, involved with the Rasmussen Library for 47 years now, 
uh, first as a bibliographer and then as a curator of rare books. Um, and uh, I have an experience uh, in that uh, I also taught uh, in uh, the history department, and I purchased uh, books around what the uh, Rasmussen Library didn't have. Um, but now uh, there's not enough uh, shelving in Rasmussen Library. They lost a whole level. Uh, level six is is used for is going to be used for another uh, uh, job. And uh, and so we've been uh, uh, putting boxes all over the place. I mean, we have places to store these books. We still have access to them and all that, but uh, um, we're just uh, chock full. We have enough room for the Alaskana. That's not a, 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 in, in problem right now, but... Uh, and uh, as far as, as volume is, uh, the value for these books is that um, I'm no longer um, ch chasing the um, uh, the trade, and uh, I'm not I'm not up on on what uh, what the current uh, prices are. Um, but I, you know, I'd like to get rid of a few of my my uh, European books. I have about a thousand of them. Uh, Dealing with medieval history, um, uh, lying uh, German uh, uh, books of various sorts, French, and uh, and all of that, and it's kind of specialized. So um, I'm thinking uh, that uh, I'd like to uh, have uh, you know someone to uh, uh, some place to go, and I had an experience too with in trying to to sell some of this stuff. Uh, at one time, I had I was in conversation with Powell's, and uh, I have a large enough collection that um, uh, they wanted it, but it turns out that um, that it would cost me uh, more to ship it down than I would have gotten uh, from from the income. So I mean, it's uh, it was kind of a dead end. Well, you you could fly down multiple times and take extra baggage <laughs> <laughs> for free. You know, yeah. There are rare, there are specialty bookstores around. I, I know that the Library Foundation uh, received through the library a donation uh, of of books one time, and one of them was a large, oversized, big old book of uh, anatomical drawings dealing with hernias from the. 1820s and the guy that did the illustrations was a frenchman who was the most eminent medical illustrator in the western world at that time and so the book was worth about five thousand dollars uh because we found a bookstore a rare book dealer who specialized in medical books so if you can find that niche dealer for some of those books sometimes so maybe marvin you could find a niche dealer there to <laughs> <laughs> yeah focus on that but that's but of course one time you know we had this thing you know communication is always an issue and uh we had a, a person working at Nolween library on the desk who had uh been scared by reports that we didn't have space to take donations and and uh we couldn't guarantee that if you give us a book that it's going to go on the shelf and so this man came in he wanted to donate a book they said, but before I donate it, I want to make sure it's going to go on the shelf, that the library is not going to just put it on the used book sale. And uh, and she said, well, no, it, it, we can't make that guarantee. Well, it turns out he came and visited with me afterwards, uh, but quite a bit afterwards because he left in a huff and he contacted uh, the Smithsonian who sent a team down to retrieve this book because it was a first edition Huckleberry Finn. Uh -huh. A true first edition, and yeah, <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and that, well, that's that, a bundle. I haven't that looked that one up. That, huh? Is that the kind of thing that would that you would want to put on the on the shelf? Oh God, no, no. But we might want to put it in our antiquarian collection. But more mm -hmm. than likely, we'd want to sell it to uh, uh, make sure it got into a library that had humidity control and those type of things, right. and uh, and use the books the the proceeds. Uh, that's what. Uh, when I came to Nolwing Library in 1990, there there was a very small Alaskana collection that was crammed into the Alaskana room. It's where the study rooms are now. And there were 40,000 rare books in there. 
And these were valuable, rare books that Barbara Gorman and her husband had donated to the library. Her father was a printer and he, he worked for one of the big newspaper syndicates in Chicago. And almost every important author from the first half of the 20th century, he had them. And uh, the collection had been cherry picked over quite a bit by the time I came, but they're still, they, they donated 70,000 volumes, 40,000 of them were still here. And that included a complete run of Hemingway's books, first edition in the jackets, Steinbeck's books in the jackets, uh, Fitzgerald, you know, everybody, all of them were there. <laughs> 1,000 different editions of Omar Khayyam's Rubiat of Omar Khayyam. It was, anyway, it was an astounding collection. Uh, but the, uh, now, of course, now I forgot the direction I was going in with that. But, well, but the, the point was we sold the books. Uh, I convinced the board that we couldn't take care of the books. Uh, a previous director had promised the Gormans that he would get a special wing built onto Nolwein Library that would be a rare book collection to hold this important collection. Because we didn't have, we don't have humidity control, the type of temperature control, the the all the protection you need for a collection like that at our little library here. So it made sense to get those books into the possession of libraries that could take care of them, and that money became the corpus that uh, floated the uh, library foundation for a good long while. Uh, and um, anyway, you just you just never know, but the, what's going to show up, but. Uh, they in that case we were able to bring up Shorey's came up Powell sent a team up and they all went through and and, and bought you know picked out the the best and and actually Jerry Cleworth ended up buying the remainder he bought the, the last twenty thousand books I believe or so uh, from the foundation. Well, at least you can say you handled those books and had them for a little while. Well, actually, I went to Jerry after we sold them and I bought some from him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, uh, there's some first edition. Uh, uh, Wizard of Oz books, Frank L. Baum books that my daughter really likes uh, uh, Oz books quite a bit. She was young then. And uh, and these were battered, really beat up copies. You know, in condition, they might be acceptable, but they're down at the bottom of the scale. But still, the first edition's Oz books, and they're pretty cool. So we, uh, yeah, so I, I imagine Jerry would be glad to sell you some of his books, too. <laughs> But that's Denise, not what we're here for, is it? To get rid no. of the books, not to, <laughs> not to get more books. Denise, yeah. I'm curious about what what kinds of books sell best in the bookstore there. Is there anything that that people are most interested in here in Fairbanks? Oh, you're muted. I'm muted or she is? She is. I was muted. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, well, we sell lots and lots of kids, children's books. Um, for We sell a lot of fiction, um, a, a literature and um, mysteries, especially. And then we, for a lot of Alaskana and, you know, out of our vintage section, but um, probably a lot of history and biographies are also really popular. Interesting. I, I do have a, a question. I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to monopolize, monopolize. I want everybody to have a chance to ask questions. But I, I have traveled quite a bit and I've brought back maps and booklets and things from many of the places that I've traveled to. Do you have a place? I don't think they'd sell for anything, but would people be interested in the, those sorts of things? Um, only we've had a few people ask for stuff like that for art projects. Um, pretty much if anything travel related we found if it's more than about five or six years old then you know if it's just because so many of them talk about where to stay where to eat a lot of that kind of stuff and that stuff you know there's always that turnover with restaurants and mm -hmm. hotel or you know visitor industry stuff like that that they're so out of date they'll only people will buy it for using in like art projects or for crafts for kids for doing things like that. Um, yeah, we've had, I had a box of older maps out in the store before and nobody took anything out of it except for somebody doing an art project. Well, so that part's good too. Yep. But if it's Just, about the culture or something, it might be. 
Yeah. yeah if it's just generally about the culture or, mm -hmm. hey, the year I spent in this country or something like that. But if it's anything about places to go and see, sites to see, mm -hmm. you know, some even some of that stuff, you know, things open and close all the time. So like traveling for five dollars a day or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Um, Greg. Do how does the library deal with paperback donations? Well, they take uh, they have a some a display of free uh, free paperbacks. So you can just bring in paperbacks, put them on the display, and people just come and take them. You know, there's no money involved, that sort of thing. So they do have a a, 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 a big display. Close, I think it used it used to be right next to the uh, the fireplace area. But does the library look through them to see if any of them should be in the library? Well, they're not taking, they would if they were taking donations per se, where they, you know, people bring in boxes and, and library and goes through them and says, oh yeah, we can add this, or, or this might be good at Rasmus or something like that. But, uh, used, but not for just general trade paperbacks at this stage. I think they're not taking any donations currently. I'm sorry, I was late coming to the meeting. So maybe you said that. Um, and is that because of the going to be doing the addition and all that? Or, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's going to be a while before they do start taking any. Another year or two. At least, yeah. What about the North, North Pole Library? Well, I don't know how many. They don't have storage. I know that because uh, I helped draw the plans up. Because uh, they count on Noween having that uh, that capability, and they don't have the work area to assess them, because that's supposed it's a branch library as opposed to a full library at North Pole. Mm -hmm. They'll be open and they'll be providing some services. Uh, I mean, they're just the normal branch services. They'll be you know you can buy you can check out the books that are there, but if you want to you know borrow some books, uh, they they uh, out of the No Wing collection out of the larger collection, they could well be in storage and they may be accessible right away. What do you do with old college textbooks? Am I thinking dump? <laughs> I don't know. Um, frequently, yes. Uh, we check them all, obviously, to see if there's value for them online. If it's something rare or unique kind of thing, then even if we don't sell it online, we might put it out in the store. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it's a biology textbook from the 70s, it you know, there's no use, no, nobody's really looking for that kind of a book or whatever. So yeah, they end up getting hauled off. It's like the, the h &R Block Income Tax Guide for 1987. You, know. <laughs> you would probably be surprised to know how many copies of Windows 95 and 98. <laughs> hey, the, help, the, the Idiot's Guide too that we get every week. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Occasionally, there are, are issues with uh, uh, that uh, become a political uh, issue. Uh, the Rasmussen Library purchased a a, a big uh, uh, general Ras uh, Russian language uh, library came up, and a lot of them were just uh, um, uh, cooking books, um, a lot of the same type and so on. Uh, in Russian, uh, but they are but that they were published in the United States, um, and so uh, we we uh, toss some of that into the into uh, the the bin, and uh, someone found that, and it became an issue because we were throwing out books, and we, we don't have enough books, and so it actually uh, was uh, covered a little bit with uh, the the newspaper. Uh, yeah. and it's hard to, to explain all that to 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 to, uh, to, to the uh, populace. Yeah, we actually had a backlash when the bar next door, um, they own the parking lot that runs right up to our building, and they moved their dumpster over up against the side of our building, and we had people storming into our building, furious that we had a dumpster outside of our building because what were we doing, <laughs> throwing away all these books? And, you know, we kept having to explain that it wasn't our dumpster. It belonged to the bar. And, you know. <laughs> well, no, and no it took way a while we're... for that to quiet down. 
at Nolwenn Library, we were always very careful to carefully box and tape the books that we were throwing away. Uh, because for that very reason, people, you know, people, you know, have a very uh, clear uh, and profound opinion that the book is sacred and all books should be, you know, how could you destroy any book, which I sure don't want to rain on that parade, but uh, especially <laughs> yeah. this day and age. Well, I know we've got a couple of librarians on the, this call today. Um, do you have anything to add, Judy and Reva? And there might be others. Yeah, Anne's there too. Yeah. Mm. Either no or they're muted. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that Judy Triplehorn has been been looking. Um, has a lot of scientific books from from trips library and, and others apparently have she's been helping sell some of the scientific books find homes for them i'm primarily trying to find people who would be interested in the history of it or whatever mm -hmm. uh, well i have a collection of edward gory books and i don't know if you know who edward gory is the artist oh, yeah. and Right, wrote very strange books. Well, I I really liked his his drawings and his books, and it turned out that my great aunt was a very close friend of his mother, oh. and they lived close together when he was young, when he was very young, and he called my my aunt his aunt Edna, and um, or Miss Edna, I guess he called her, and so some of his books are donated or dedicated to my great aunt and he oh. would send her um some of these books um and i never had a chance i didn't know about this until my great aunt died but my mom still had these so i have all the the books 20 or 30 of his books at least and um i i think it's a great collection unfortunately my vision is so bad i can't read anymore so i really you know, it's time for me to find a new home for them. I was at Noel Wiener called the resource desk for something, reference desk, and just happened to ask if this fellow knew what I could do with these books or who would want them. And he did some research and found out that there's an Edward Gorey house in Massachusetts. Um, and I contacted them and said I would send asked if they wanted the books and they said they would and I have not gotten them boxed up to send out there but I but I think I will unless somebody on this call is very interested in any of these books which are very strange but lovely he did the um drawings and if you watch um uh, masterpiece mystery, mystery yeah on uh, pbs he did the drawings at the beginning, you know, the strange lady on the roof, yeah. you know, and he also did um, uh, design sets for the uh, Metropolitan Opera. He loved opera. He loved cats. And so you see a lot of cats in his books. Uh, very. I never met him once when I was out east. I did call him and talk to him anyway. So I am. I feel good that I can donate the books to the someplace that would appreciate them because I don't know how else to find anybody who would be interested in these. They wouldn't be that valuable, but it is a collection of somebody who is an American author who is well-respected, I think, but strange. <laughs> Maybe you'll pay for shipping. I'll pay for shipping. Oh, okay. I mean, they, they kind of said they would, but I I can put them in, you know, flat rate boxes. It's it wouldn't cost much. It costs less than less than a hundred dollars to ship them. So I will do that. I just haven't gotten around to packing them up because I because I really want. He wrote a letter with some of these books that he sent to my great aunt. Wrote letters and just about what he was doing, and he thought he she would like this book and I had no idea what she thought of it. I would love to know what she really thought of it. 
<laughs> um, but uh, I haven't gotten back and read all of those letters yet. The the few that I've got, I need to do that before. Um, That's the provenance we were talking about, and that gets those type of books right into their archives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that would be a good home for it. But it's like what you said, too, just finding the right and what we said about many other types of items, um, artwork and tools and all sorts of things, just finding the right person. Um, it takes a little work sometimes to find who, how to match these things up. It's really nice when you can. Well, somebody, I guess, uh, Marilyn asked about the uh, opinions about how some children's books are, are being altered by their publishers uh, to reflect uh, less striking terms that the authors originally intended. Uh, uh, and I feel very strongly about that. Uh, in fact, I went right out and bought all the editions of Roald Dahl's book so I could reread the ones that meant a lot to me. Uh, and uh, because the, I don't know if you, I'm sure you probably heard about the publisher is actually the Roald Dahl, Roald Dahl Family Trust uh, and the publisher decided to take out words like fat and things like that out of out of his books because they might offend some children. Uh, and if you've ever read Roald Dahl, uh, it's, it takes some doing to get all the inoffensive things out. And it, the, because the problem is that children like offensive things sometimes. Uh, but they, uh, I feel very strong. I think it's a travesty. Uh, they did finally come up with a good compromise last week uh, the, where um, Penguin is the publisher. That's their puffing is their imprint. And Puffin was printing the doctors or the Roald Dahl books, and they're the ones that uh, changed the wording in it. Uh, but Penguin will continue to publish just under the Penguin imprint the original Roald Dahl, so you can read the way they're intended to be written. Because to me, it's the same thing as the N word in Huckleberry Finn. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can be upset by that word being there, but the fact is, the whole book is anti-racist. And that's how he makes the point. And it's also a reflection of the times. And Dr. Seuss is the same thing. I think it's a travesty to change Dr. Seuss. And uh, anyway, but you ask about it and that's, I, I think it's, it's a terrible thing and that books ought to stand on their own merit and new books come along and it's up to the parents to explain what these words mean to their kids. I consider it a form of censorship because we're we're all we're cutting out words or changing words that we find offensive to find other words. And eventually, if that happens again and again and again, it's going to turn out completely changing the meaning of the book. And with Roald, yeah, with Roald Dahl, they're actually uh, changing their like they he, they mentioned the fact that in the book, Witch, the witches, mm -hmm. uh, he says, well, you know, the witches all wear wigs because they're bald underneath. And so they put in a couple of sentences explain well it's okay to be bald some people are bald and they can't help you know it's entirely out of the flow of the book it's a yeah. it's a real travesty yeah but don't get me started <laughs> or me it might be too late <laughs> oh that is that is terrible it's weird i mean it's like a painter and somebody else having a print or something and painting over it well saying that this isn't right the way this was done and so wanting to do it over again um any kind of creative thing the person who created it should have the right to well it's copyrighted right so how can they change it well, well the copyright laws expire well, if you own while. the copyright you can change it you can, yeah you own it Right. Hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Ideas. We all need ideas. We're pretty quiet here. 
What's the most interesting book that you, Greg and Denise, have found that um, in your collections or, or that you've seen at the library or forget me not books? Well, at the library, to me, the most interesting book is probably the oldest one there. It's the 1658 edition of Dr. John D's Conversations with the Angels. You know, Dr. D was uh, Elizabeth I's uh, astrologer and doctor and spy. But uh, his shtick was he had a, a sidekick who was a medium who would look at a cracked crystal and could uh, communicate with the angels through that, they said. So D would pose questions. The medium would translate it to the angels and translate back what the angels said. And this was a, 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 a the compilation of their conversations, along with a whole bunch of Kabbalistic charts and weird astrological things. It's 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 a pretty strange book, but it just just its age and the fact that, gosh, here it is in Fairbanks. And, uh, well, and uh, Dr. D was a... Uh, uh, also a spy for Elizabeth, like I said, and the way he did it was he and his uh, medium partner would travel through Europe and go visit all the heads of state, and they would do a little skullduggery at the same time that they were doing uh, while they were there performing their uh, their uh, future telling act uh, or to conversations with the angels to the crown heads. Sure. But that came to no good all the way around. Well, well, for one thing, his partner suggested that the angels were tell them that they should switch partners, that they should swap wives. And that was interesting. And meantime, back in London, uh, D was, uh, had left all his goods in his house and his library, which was the best library in all of Britain at the time. Uh, he had left it back in London under the care of a, a relative who started selling off his books. And to cover it, uh, he started a rumor that D was a witch and there's witchcraft in his house and he got people worked out and they went to burn his house and destroyed his library. So that's mm. the Dr. D story. And I always think of Dr. D when I see that book on the antiquarian shelves at the library. So do they keep it locked up? Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming that's not something that the library bought. So somebody here in Fairbanks donated that book? I presume so. Well, I think it was one of the, the Gorman collection. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a, a Barbara Gorman's dad was a socialist who was a big follower of Trotsky. And he had a number of Trotsky's biographies. And I think there's one of the books that Trotsky had actually signed for him that's in that collection still. There's we have maybe 50 or 60, maybe more of that, maybe 100 books in the case, the lock case that's near the Rockwell Kent art that's uh, along the side, the far side of the wall as you go in to Nolween. But it's all lock and key. But you can talk to a librarian and they'll pull it out and you can look at it. I just wanted to say that um, very often I'm traveling down to um, Delta Junction and sometimes the other way and often stop at certainly the Delta Junction Library, which is a really sweet one. And yeah. I would be happy to bring books down to them if... Uh, people wanted to send some to them but you know it's just it's it's a great place it's a nice little library and i think what i would do is i'd contact the librarian there first make sure they could handle a couple of boxes just to see see how it goes sure i imagine they'd, they'd be glad to see them just to nothing else they could put them in their book sale <laughs> yeah they have books out that you can just take which we often do just to um read while we're camping out. Yeah. Denise, have you found any really interesting donations? Uh, well, I've seen all kinds of different things come through, but the thing that I just found, you know, and like he said, how did this thing get to Fairbanks? Um, I found a copy of Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler that was printed in 1936 in Germany, and it was in German. Unfortunately, it had been exposed, it had been in a box in somebody's shed, and it had been chewed on and gotten water damaged and stuff. And so it was, you know, there was nothing that could be done to save this book. The binding, you know, I picked it up and it just fell into pieces. But just the fact that, yeah. 
just in this random box in somebody's back shed. <laughs> well, I, it's a, a little after four, but I do have one more question for you. Would it, when we donate books to Forget Me Not Books, is, would it be good for us to kind of sort the way we think? Maybe would it be helpful to you before we bring them to you? I or mean, as far as sorting them, um, there's not really need because we sort them into how we need them here. But mm -hmm. we do have a list. It's on our donation guidelines that at our website, and it talks about the the kinds of items that we can't use. So that way, you know, just to try to limit the number of block things that we have to go through that we already know we can't use. You know, like the old textbooks, old computer books, you know, old travel books, things that have been, you know, water damage, chewed on by dogs or other animals, you know, smoke damaged, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Because that's the majority of the books that we get rid of are because they are damaged and we just, you know, we can't use it. We can't sell to somebody a book that's covered in mold and the pages are stuck together. <laughs> no matter how nice uh, the actual the book itself is you know the yeah. contents of the book yeah well thank you all for coming are there any last comments from the two of you that um uh i know people will probably be contacting you or bringing books to literacy council um anything before we go that you'd like to add to um, so the lady who said she travels to Delta all the time, we do have a list here that we are always on the lookout for ty certain titles for the Delta Library, and we have a box here that we put them into and then just wait for, you know, somebody from there to come by here and pick them up and bring them back to Delta. If, you know, if you wanted to just, when you're going that way, just check with us, and if we have any books in that box and you could take them down to them, that would be wonderful. That was probably me, and I'm traveling to Delta Junction on Sunday. Okay, and I do believe we have some books and stuff in the Delta box. So, yeah, if you wanted to just swing by and pick it up and take them on down sure. to them. Sure, I will try to um, by the end, by Friday. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's a Tiki, Tiki Levins. I want to say Tiki Levinson is the person that I've dealt with there i'll have to go and double check my emails and remind i think that was her name but i could be thinking of a different organization so yeah we usually have a fairly full car <clears throat> um so it would be good to know if um you want us to do that or not and i can yeah. persuade my well, and friend if you, if, yeah, if you don't go that. this time if you yeah, if it doesn't go this time the next time but it's normally a small box like a small flat rate box type size it's yeah. never a huge box. Okay. Well, shall I ask if you have something ready on Friday? Um, yeah, I, I know I do have some books in the box. So if you wanted okay. to just stop by and grab it, and it's just, yeah, for the Delta Library. I'll see if that we can do that. Sounds All right, good. great. Thank you. Greg, any last comments? No, I think I've, I've rambled on enough, probably. <laughs> Well, this has been great. It's really been fun. Thank you so much, everybody. And next week we'll be talking, or next month, um, I don't remember the date. It's the second Wednesday that we meet. And again, it will probably not be at three o'clock, but maybe at five, either on that Wednesday or we'll, we've got to work with his, his schedule um, about coins and books and ivory. So uh, hope to see you then too. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.